everyone. Welcome. Well, I should welcome today too, although you've already been here for a session, so welcome is a little inappropriate. In my second talk at MIF, I usually use the opportunity, since yesterday I went through my macro thesis, I'm not going to do that again. I use this opportunity to outline in very brief my investment thesis for all of the companies who are present here at the conference who I have in my portfolio. Um, between companies that I invited to come and companies that my peer newsletter writers invited to come that I also own, the list is quite long. It's like half of the companies that are here are ones that I own. So um, I tried to put them all in a presentation. I literally ran out of time. I didn't have five of them in as of 10 minutes ago. So rather than not have five in a presentation, which would not be a good idea, I don't have slides. I'm just going to quickly go through. But I actually kind of like that, because the point here is to summarize the investment thesis in about a minute. And I think that's helpful because you guys are overwhelmed with information here. There's a lot of good stories. And for every stock that you own, you should have that specific reason why you own it, right? And so that's what I've tried to do is just distill it down to that reason. Um, and so hopefully, if there's a story that you're interested in, um, maybe this can help, uh, help clarify or guide that interest a little bit. I'm just doing them in alphabetical order because you got to choose an order. So, um, off the bat, Discovery Harbor. Discovery Harbor is, a, I would call it a, a, a new, small, almost micro-cap company with a very interesting buried gold target in Nevada. It's done well in the portfolio from re reawakening. It was in slumber for a long time. But now it is finishing up the last stages of drill targeting and getting ready to drill. It's permitting for that. And the market really loves buried gold targets in Nevada right now. And so I think there could be a lot of excitement as this story um, gets into the real drilling phase. So that's Discovery Harbor. Ely Gold Royalties. A uh, couple reasons to like Ely. One, small royalty companies per perform later in a gold cycle than the large royalty companies. We know Franco, Royal, Sandstone, they've already been performing because they perform early. The small ones are more like project generators. They perform later in the cycle. So just from a cycle perspective, I think Ely is well positioned. But Ely is also basically cash flow positive. They brought in $3 million last year. They've got a very unique ability to understand land holdings and property opportunities in Nevada, and they demonstrate that with a press release every two weeks about a new deal that they've signed. So I think for exposure to Nevada and for timing in the cycle and for a um, well-capitalized company, I like Ely in the royalty front. Erdine, two-pronged approach. This is sort of the definition of that, those projects that I like that are strong and splashy. So the strength from the Buy and Hundy Gold project that should have a feasibility study out and likely permitting complete within six months. It's a very strong, it's not a huge gold project, but it's a very strong gold project. Over a 40% IRR at a conservative gold price. And a 3.7 gram per ton open pit. That's pretty standout on its own. The splash side is that this is a team in Mongolia. This is an area where they can step 200 meters outside of their resource and make a new discovery. Because no one's ever explored this area before, like literally no one. So there's a lot of exploration potential there. I also think there's a lot of strategic interest, not from the conventional players, not necessarily from Barrick or Agnico or sort of the players that we think of, but from Russian, from Chinese, from private groups. They're more prone to be interested in Mongolia, and I know they're interested in Erdin. Fireweed has a very large, high-grade zinc asset in Yukon. The thing to t remember about fireweed is the PEA that they, that they issued last year says that the project makes sense as is. Obviously, that's PEA level, but it makes sense as is. What you learn from that is that everything they can add on top is, is gravy, makes it better. And there's a lot of opportunities to add on top. They've, ex they've assumed the entire cost of the road in their um, PEA. It's likely that that will be a joint venture with the government, so that will have a significant bottom line impact. And then there's the exploration. And here, also remember, the team is not just trying to add tons. They are trying to add grade, and they're trying to add tons that matter to economics. So 
uh, open pitable tons that could boost the scale of the operation. So this is a team that's really focused on making this mine make sense. It already does, and they're focused on making it better. It's also a very tight share structure. Great Bear, uh, we all know a lot about Great Bear. The LP fault discovery has broken this story wide open. The hinge and main or limb zones that they had before, classic red leg zones, great. LP has millions of ounces of gold in it. They are marching along trying to delineate that, but this is a phenomenal story. If the LP fault has part of the ounces that it could have based on the continuity consistency that we've seen so far, Great Bear still has a lot of upside even from its current share price. There's a big if in that sentence, but I think it's, a, um, I think it's, a, it's likely. High Gold, still a pretty new company, spin out from Constantine. Focus is the Johnson Tract project in Alaska. Totally forgotten asset because it was in a native corporation for two decades. That native corporation got to know Darwin when he was working in Alaska with Constantine. That's how this company came to be. Johnson Track produces phenomenal drill results. The seven holes that they managed to punch into it late last season returned re results like 60 meters of 15 grams gold. Guess what? The market paid attention, so the stock has already done well. Next season, the challenge is to show that the zone has room to expand. Darwin has a lot of confidence in that. That's, a, that's still a question, but that's what the market is excited about. In the meantime, they also have some really interesting high-grade gold projects in Ontario, and they will have a news release out soon about their plans to advance those in Ontario. So we're not looking at a dearth of news for six months. We're looking at a focus, at potential for the market to be like, oh, you also can generate ounce intercepts in Ontario. There's, there's possibility there for that. Otherwise, it's a very strong shareholder registry, a tight share count, and very well capitalized. Integra, one of the companies that's up on stage here with me, this is a project in Idaho. The PEA that they put out on Delamar really clarified the current value of what they have. And that was important. The share price responded because it crystallized that this is an opportunity already with scale, 124,000 ounces a year, good returns, um, easy, simple operation. And then, just like other companies in that strong with splash category, there's the exploration side. So, or, or Dean, that's the other one that I was talking about. Integra, lots of really interesting exploration going on there. The team has now had their fingers deep in this project for our, almost two years, and they've really improved their understanding of the geology there. So I think both in searching for high grade, we know it was there, there was a super high grade underground operation there 100 years ago, and in expanding the open pit, uh, moderate grade potential there. Um, I think there's a lot of exploration news that will come out of Integra that the market's gonna pay attention to. And just an advanced, um, large scale at gold asset, Brownfields environment in a supportive jurisdiction in North America, that's, a, that's something to pay attention to on its own. Core mining. This is the one that has another strong with splash story. So the Imperial Project in California, it's a permitting story. Um, I think the per the I think it's there's a good chance that they will get the permit, and that makes Imperial an advanced, simple heap leach operation that's right next door to Mesquite. Imperial County is very poor. The Mesquite mine is very important. Mesquite is out of ore. They're literally mining their waste dumps right now at Mesquite. So there's lots of county reason to get the permit for Imperial. Um, there's synergies possible there. Does CORE take over Mesquite? Does Mesquite take over CORE? There's all kinds of possibilities there for how this thing could become um, more advanced more quickly. That's Imperial. It's a really solid foundational asset, but then they also have exploration potential at Imperial and at Long Valley, which is another asset in California, and at FG Gold, which is an exploration project in BC. Macquarie, a, a conservative bank, invested because of Imperial. Eric Sprott invested because of the exploration potential of the other projects. So definite, uh, not a one-trick pony. This is not just about permitting at Imperial. There's a lot of other interesting things going on with CORE. Morian, 
is a royalty company, but specifically it's a royalty company where the paying asset is the Donkin coal mine in Nova Scotia. Donkin is ramping up right now. Morian is focused on paying out the majority of its royalty proceeds to shareholders as dividends. As Morian ramps up, the amount of money that it gets, I mean, the numbers are a bit hard to wrap your head around because they're so good. That's why Morian management keeps buying stock and Morian keeps buying back its stock. This is a company that I think won't exist um, in that long because I think the operators of the Donkin Mine are likely to expand the operation there. The bigger the operation gets, the more money Morian gets because of the structure of their royalty. And at some point, it doesn't make sense for the mine to be paying Morian 20, 25 million dollars a year that they would pay out to only their, they would pay 80% of out to only their 50 million shareholders. That's the kind of story that Morian is, and we will hear more about it shortly. Precipitate has a still fairly new to them land package next door to the fourth largest gold mine in the world. It actually wraps around the Pueblo Viejo mine in the Dominican Republic. This land package has been explored before, but it was always explored in the, can we just find a bit more of Pueblo Viejo? Can we just go and like find a bit more of the deposit that exists that barracks mining a million ounces from every year? Uh, Precipitate is the first group to come in and have a standalone exploration thesis on this ground. And when you put together the mapping, the alteration, the geophysics, the soil sampling, the targets are very compelling. And one of them, there's Pueblo Viejo here. Barrick is busy exploring its new discovery, Arroyo, which is right here. Precipitate's target is right here. This isn't just an extension of the deposit that is. This is a string of opportunities that are in the same camp as a very massive, very rich gold deposit. So it's a really, they haven't started drilling yet. They will um, in the next little while. So it's a, it's a risk, it's an exploration bet, but I think it's a really exciting exploration bet. Prime is pushing their project in Mexico towards development. Now, in general, the market gets, the general, the market doesn't have a ton of patience. So projects being pushed towards development is kind of the definition of when they don't, when the market doesn't pay attention, except when the build decision is like eight months out because this project has seen so much past work and is so straightforward. Oxide deposits here, there, potential to find new ones, um, straightforward uh, heat bleach processing, easy permitting. Um, so this is a quick to production um, project in Mexico that has the potential for exploration upside and therefore scale upside. Um, and it's a tight capital structure and um, the, the team there is very focused on keeping the structure tight and keeping, um, keeping the upside available for shareholders as this gets into operation. So I think it's the kind of story that in a few months will really start to shine because that timeline to production that people always worry about is so far out is coming close and it's coming close quite fast. Quebec Precious Metals. The James Bay area is a really underexplored greenstone belt relative to other greenstone belts in Ontario and Quebec that have been pummeled with exploration. James Bay is uh, not seen anywhere near as much, but yet has a few very good deposits. One of them is Eleanor. The mine there is running out of ore. The Sakami project that Quebec Precious Metals has is 90 kilometers away. The zone that they've put most of their work into there looks darn good. 900 meters of strike, 600 meters down dip, 10 to 20 meters wide. Four to six grams per ton is a lot of the drill holes come back with that. So the initial resource that they're pushing towards that will come out this year, I think has the potential to surprise the market with its scale and its grade. Newmont Gold Corp, which owns Eleanor, already has bought into Quebec Precious Metals. There's a consolidation aspect for the region with Quebec Precious Metals leading that charge, supported by Newmont. There's a lot of reasons why this asset is interesting, um, and they just raised a bunch of money, so they're well capitalized to do the work they need this year. I know this is a lot of companies. I've still got a few. Stick with me. Sitka Gold. Sitka, another emerging story. Um, debuted publicly two years ago. Um, the first project didn't work. Established a new portfolio of projects. Now has four projects. Three will get attention this year, and I like all three of them. 
One of them is Burrow Creek, defined deposit at one end, epithermal vein, a bunch of younger rock covers, outcrop over here with the same looking vein, okay. Soils, show it, show the gold continuing. No one's ever explored in the interim. That in the, in the strike in between, which is 1.3 kilometers. That's where Sitka is currently drilling. So hopefully that vein just continues right along there and that should be, in the grand scheme of exploration, it looks to me like a lower risk exploration opportunity because of the evidence that's right there. Um, so that's Burrow Creek. Drills currently turning, results already coming out. Then there's RC Gold and Yukon where they just consolidated this huge land package between you know, Victoria Gold's new mine and Brewery Creek's mine that's gonna get going. Underexplored, tons of targets, super interesting opportunity right there. Lots of work that's been done but almost no drilling. So sort of ready to go there. And then there's the Alpha Project down in Nevada, a buried gold target, which like I said at the beginning, the market is really interested in buried gold targets. So I think Sitka is another one that has um, a bunch of irons in the fire that are all interesting. Okay, I've got four more, if you can believe it. And I've got three minutes and 43 seconds. Strategic, we will hear from Richard from Strategic here shortly. He will do a much better job of the story than I. Strategic is a project generator focused on Yukon with an incredibly strong technical team with more knowledge of Yukon than anybody else has. The real excitement that Strategic has um, introduced this year has to do with one of their projects in Yukon that returned some really phenomenal results. The market got very excited. Strategic is a really interesting company. It's got some investments, some strategic investments um, that also stand out. but. This company has money, this company has drill targets. Strategic had never drilled its own projects, basically, until this one, and this one was too good to pass up. So I will let Richard outline the details of that to you, but it looks like a pretty exciting moment. Troilus, Troilus is also up on stage here with me. Another story of taking an, a historic mine and finding new opportunity there. The Troilus mine in Quebec was a good operation, but the company that operated it wanted the gold multiple and so found a gold mine and mined the obvious deposit there. They literally didn't put an exploration hole like 50 meters out, I might be slightly exaggerating, but like almost 50 meters outside of the pit, no exploration. The Troilus team saw that opportunity, they've moved in and they have been um, almost, like they've doubled the resource twice, Justin can correct that, but almost doubled the resource twice since getting there because there was such a lack of exploration. This is a project that has a 50 kilowatt or megawatt power line already to it because it was a historic mine, a road that goes right there. So it's set up should they have enough gold and they're well on their way to demonstrating that there's a lot of gold left there. So I think Troilus is an under-recognized story of a mine that could come back to life. Valor, I'm in the V's, right? Alphabetical order, we've gotta be almost done. V, Valor. This is the PGM project in Brazil, Pedra Branca. Palladium is going crazy. There's hardly, I, I said yesterday that Palladium's new pricing represents a new paradigm for PGM projects. With, with Palladium worth $2,000, $1,700, $2,300, whatever the number is, that's a dramatically different setup than it being worth $800. So that means that, first of all, projects um, deserve a second look. And secondly, there, we've been in a shortage of palladium for seven years and it's not getting fixed anytime soon. So companies, the palladium miners out there need new projects. Bellor has a whole bunch of really um, strong data for its project down in Brazil. Um, the previous operator wanted massive deposits only. It never even explored anomalies that didn't have at least three kilometers of strike. So that left every, every anomaly with less than three kilometers of strike, which is really big, untested and therefore Valor to look at. There are a few defined deposits that give them a fingerprint for exactly what they're looking for in terms of geochemistry and geophysics. So a really interesting exploration project if you want PGM exposure. And then finally, Visla. This is the Silver Vein Panuco project. In Mexico, this is a really cool story of having cobbled together a land position, a historic mining district. They've been mining silver there for 450 years. 
the veins that they have been mining have been so consistent that they haven't really had to do a lot of exploration, and they've only ever mined down to the water table because these are small-scale miners. The combination means that you put in modern exploration, geophysics, you put in the ability to go below the water table, and there's real potential there for a lot of silver. Silver stories are always lacking in a precious, metal, precious metals bull market. High grade, rapidly growing silver stories can really outperform. We saw that with Silvercrest, even though the, the, during a time when the precious metals market wasn't that strong. Um, so Vishala has that kind of potential. Still very early days on the exploration front, um, but early signs are good. Whew, thanks for sticking with me. That was a lot of companies. And now um, I'm done, which is great. And I. <laughs>